What are some natural ways you can improve your mental health? Whether it's ADHD, an eating disorder, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, there is nutritional supplementation available to help your symptoms. I'm calling in the big guns and an expert in this area today. The What's Eating You podcast is a series of mental health topics that are designed to make you think, learn, educate, and validate. Enjoy the show. Dr. Georgie Stoichev is a queer licensed naturopathic doctor in the state of California. He completed a one-year clinical residency program with a specialized focus on naturopathic approaches to mental health, including ADHD. He received his undergraduate degree in nutrition and dietetics in the UK, where he became a registered dietitian before becoming a doctor of naturopathic medicine from Bastia University, California. Dr. Stoichev is passionate about mental health. He utilizes therapeutic modalities such as nutrition, lifestyle medicine, herbs, botanical medicine, and nutritional supplements as part of his holistic approach to mental health and his own journey with ADHD. All right, Dr. Stoichev, tell us a little bit about what ate you or how you got into this line of work. Well, thank, thanks for having me on here, Steph. You know, you know, everyone has their own personalized story, so that makes us a lot more passionate to do what we do. Um, so I personally have ADHD and I was diagnosed as an adult. So I had all these years of like catching up to do on like figuring out, you know, you always suspect that you have it, but especially as a healthcare professional, but, um, you know, having the official diagnosis can really change your life, like 180 degrees. Um, so that really like sparked me. And I always, I just started like learning more, educating myself more, like taking more continuous education on it and all that stuff. Um, and eventually it just became my passion. Um, so ADHD is probably the number one thing that I see, but mental health as a whole is like really, really important to me just because I feel like we focus on physical health so much that we ignore a very important piece of mental health. And we oftentimes label people as something and there's like judgment behind it and, Mm -hmm. You know, we just uh, have to sometimes step back and take a step back and listen and um, just figure out what's going on because there's usually something deeper. So, yes, a hundred percent. And I, for those that don't know, I actually came across your work on TikTok. And that's why I love Mm -hmm. TikTok because you're obviously, are you in Canada? I am in the United States. Oh, US. Funny San Diego. (laughs) (laughs) I love that because. I'm not sure in Australia, we don't, we have naturopaths, we have kinesiologists, but when I saw you're a naturopathic doctor specializing in mental health, I thought, wow, this is what we need because I get asked all the time, what are some natural ways I can manage my ADHD? And obviously I'm trying to stay within my scope of practice because ethics and all. So I was really excited to speak with you because Tell me a little bit about what exactly does a naturopathic doctor who specializes in mental health do? Sure. Yeah. I I mean, to the best of my knowledge, naturopathic doctors exist in uh, the United States and in Canada. So those are the two sort of countries that um, there are schools for naturopathic doctors. And, you know, training is somewhat similar to regular doctors in the United States in the sense that we go through undergraduate school, which is four years, and then we go through postgraduate school, which is four more years. Um, and then obviously we take the licensing exams, uh, similarly to our conventional colleagues. Um, what we do is we learn about all the conventional ways to diagnose. So like, uh, you know, like any lab testing, imaging and all that stuff for mental health. We obviously don't need imaging per se for a mm-hmm. diagnosis. It's usually like a clinical interview that we do. Um, So we learn about all that. We learn about conventional management of diseases, including mental health conditions. So the pharmaceutical treatment of things. Um, And depending on the state, um, because it's newer professions, scope of practice varies. So like in some states you can prescribe in other states, um, you know, less so just because it's newer. Mm -hmm. Um, And we also learn about the natural things or naturopathic modalities that can support mental health. So Nutrition recommendations, lifestyle recommendations, herbs, botanical medicine, those are big. 
um, and just um, homeopathy is another one. So we mm. just focus on the person as a whole. I love that. Improve. Yeah. Oh, it's like it's so needed. I feel you are a one stop. Mm-hmm shop whereas over here it's you go to one person for your naturopath you go to another one for your psychology Mm -hmm. so when you say you diagnose do you diagnose sort of medical or um you know like ibs or Mm -hmm. adrenal stuff or do you diagnose Mm -hmm. mental health stuff or no uh both you can do both um especially um if you're in a state where you have the full scope of practice you can diagnose physical health conditions you Mm. can diagnose mental health conditions so it definitely is dependent on where you are for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Okay. And with yeah. me- with medication, can you prescribe, say, ADHD medication? Great question. So I'm in California and California is a newer state where, you know, MDs were recently licensed, okay. uh, like in 2012, I believe. So um, I can only prescribe um under the supervision of an md or a do which are the two types of mm. um you know doctors in the us um and i can if even if i was to be under that supervision i would only be able to prescribe the non stimulants got it um just because the stimulants are like a what we call here you know schedule 2 drugs so they're you know risk of addiction and all that stuff so yeah, yeah. it's a schedule 8 over here <laughs> so exactly <laughs> Yeah. It's same code. So it's really interesting yeah. because everyone's like, it's so hard to get um, stimulants over here. I wouldn't mm-hmm. say it's hard. I just think the process isn't clear. So in Australia, a psychologist mm-hmm. can diagnose ADHD, but to be mm-hmm. considered for medication, you do need to get diagnosed by a psychiatrist. psychiatrist. Um, yeah, who then prescribes it. But is there... I've got a few friends over there in mm-hmm. in the US and they say, you know, it's so hard to get our Adderall and to get our medication. Is there some mm-hmm. sort of like stimulant shortage over there or how is ADHD managed over there? I'm just curious to know because it's really big in Australia at the moment. Yeah. Great question. There recently was a stimulant shortage in particular Adderall, if I'm not mistaken. So there was definitely a lot of, you know, it was in the media for sure. So yeah, I mean, stimulants are a commonly prescribed drug here. Obviously, you need to be assessed by um, either a psychiatrist or we also have, I'm not sure if you have them in Australia, psychiatric nurse practitioners. So mm-hmm. those are, uh, you know, nurses who then go on to pursue postgraduate training and prescription rights and all that stuff. Um, and I also believe PAs or physician assistants who specialize mm-hmm. in psychiatry can also do that. Um, so it all varies state on state, state, state by state. That's the difference, I guess. On these yes. Like some of these smaller professions have a different scope. All right. Depending on where you are. Got it. Got it. So let's, um, well, let's go into what we came here for because so many people do ask it. me, what can I do for my ADHD? Are there natural remedies, etc." So mm-hmm. maybe even before we get into that, can you tell me a little bit about how hormones affect our mental health. I'm not sure if you work a lot with hormones, but I know there's so much because obviously if your hormones are out of whack, your mood can be out of whack and then people get diagnosed with certain um, disorders. So yeah, what's your perspective on hormones and mental health? Gosh, it's like one of the missing puzzle pieces. Yes. Um, So yeah, hormones are big and we can probably talk about it for hours, but I guess uh, like a s- small summary, I guess if we started with testosterone in male health in particular is a big player. Um, testosterone deficiency or insufficiency is so common and there's so many reasons for it. You know, the the serious and severe reasons are not as common, but, mm-hmm. the, you know, it's called secondary uh, testosterone deficiency is a lot more common, you know, especially with nowadays society, nutrition and all that stuff. It can cause low testosterone levels. And um, in guys in particular, I see it so frequently and it can mm. present with things like depression, anxiety, yes. brain fog, um, low libido and fatigue. And those are the symptoms of depression. So it's like definitely something worth looking into yes especially in our male population 
I'm so glad you mentioned that because um, someone very close to me was feeling that way. They were tired all the time, mm-hmm. but they were doing all the right things, getting nine hours of sleep a night, eating well, going to the gym, mm-hmm. but they just felt this exhaustion. They got their hormones tested. This is a male and yeah. he was low in testosterone. And I did some research and 40% of men are low in testosterone. But I think the problem is society thinks it's normal to be tired yeah. all the time. Yeah. It's not, it's is crazy. it? Yeah, it's not. It, it's so common, but it's not normal. <laughs> it's so common. It's not normal to be tired all the time. Yeah. And people are just drinking caffeine or just, I don't know, accepting it. But I refused to accept that. And um, so did the person I'm speaking about. And ever since they've been on um, TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, and it has completely shifted everything. Yeah. It can be life changing. This is why we focus on, you know, ideally finding the root cause of what's causing your symptoms, because when you do, then you really make a change. And we, we know that testosterone, if deficient, when we replace it, it can help improve serotonin levels in our brain. And then Mm -hmm. serotonin in turn can help with what's called neuroplasticity, which is, you know, making sure our connections are um diverse in our brain and just making sure that our brain cells are thriving so definitely an important puzzle piece yeah um in particular for mental health yeah Yeah. so ladies if you're listening to this and you're if you're in a um, heterosexual relationship and your partner is complaining that um he's tired or low mood or brain fog or fatigue get those hormones tested get that testosterone Mm -hmm. checked out now what about um females what do you typically see when it comes to hormones what's the biggest missing piece of the puzzle that you come across great question so with uh with female health there are probably two distinct hormone imbalances if i could say that um we look into one of them is very common it's extremely common it's called estrogen dominance i'm not sure if you've heard of it before Mm. but it's basically where there is a relatively higher amount of estrogen compared to progesterone which are the two female hormones um and what it usually presents with like a collection of symptoms and those could be like heavy periods or like heavy menstruation Mm. um really bad menstrual cramps PMS or premenstrual syndrome, um, fibroids in the uterus, um, endometriosis can be part of that, which is like a very, um, you know, severe and painful and debilitating condition, um, having a lot of clots with your menstrual cycle. And then of course the mental health symptoms with this are like most commonly anxiety, but also sometimes depression. So Mm. that's definitely something I see as a common, um, cluster of symptoms. Wow. So you see um, estrogen is significantly higher than progesterone and that can Mm -hmm. lead to debilitating periods, cramps, premenstrual Mm -hmm. symptoms and premenstrual dysphoric disorder? Potentially. Yeah, potentially. Uh, PMS more frequently, but PMDD sometimes, yeah. Sometimes because Mm -hmm. I do get asked a lot, what can I do for my PMDD. And if anyone's listening, Mm -hmm. premenstrual dysphoric disorder is a mental health condition, which is funny because there's a lot of physical symptoms, Mm -hmm. but it's the mood component. So around the time of the month, it's very cyclical in nature. It comes around the same time. And Mm -hmm. um, women really struggle with irritability, depression, and uptake in interpersonal conflict, severe PMS, anxiety, and depression. And I've noticed you spoke about this in your videos. So from a naturopathic health perspective, is there anything you can suggest for people with severe PMS or PMDD? Um, Almost like anything, um, a a very good diagnosis is always the first step. So wanting to make sure that you have that is very important because um, obviously treatment varies depending on what you have in Mm. terms of diagnosis. Um, and part of it is understanding the pathophysiology or like what is wrong when it comes to PMDD and like a very common, uh, you know, it's uh, with science and medicine. We don't understand, the more we understand, the more we realize we don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, a big part of PMDD is this genetic susceptibility 
to the fluctuations of the hormones. So it's not per se like a deficiency or insufficiency in any of the hormones, but yeah. more so the changes of the hormones cause really significant reactions, whether that's physical health or mental health reactions. Mm. Um, yeah. And uh, conventionally, we have two ways in which we treat that, which is um, the oral contraceptive pill, probably one of the most common ways, um, or SSRIs, which are our selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So. Yep. We uh, and they're both relatively effective. They don't work for everyone, uh, but when they do, they work pretty well. Um, so obviously, naturopathically, there's um, a lot we can do to balance hormones and minimize this re- reaction that happens to their changes month to month. Mm. Um, so yeah. Yes. And my next two questions, because I know everyone's going to be asking, well, how do I test my hormones? Because I'm not sure if it's the same over there, but in Australia, doctors can sometimes be a little bit funny when you ask for specific tests. If you want to test what your blood type is or what your hormones level is. And I know this because recently I went to a naturopathic um, doctor and they've said, look, your doctor may not approve this, but if Mm -hmm. they don't, you've got to you, we have to pay hundreds to have specialized tests. So I'm not sure if those tests are, I don't know, gate kept over there or, or mm-hmm. doctors are reluctant to do them. But how do you test your hormones? Is it a blood test, a saliva test, et cetera? Great question. Um, so with hormone testing, so the reason doctors are reluctant to run this test is because <clears throat> they don't often find any um, like absolute abnormalities in it. Um, which is why, um, there's nothing really to do conventionally to support that. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you could easily test testosterone levels in your blood and that can show you a lot. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it true that doctors <laughs> have such a massive range of markers? So for example, if you went to get your estrogen, your testosterone, or even just anything tested, the markers that doctors have, the range is so big, whereas when you go to a naturopath, the ranges are so small. So you can say, oh, look, this could be potentially problematic. Let's work on it where the doctor's like, you're not sick yet. You're still within the okay frame or range. Yeah. Um, so usually the way lab reference ranges are derived is usually you get a small subset of like healthy people and you measure their their particular marker, for example, like estrogen or progesterone in this case, and you derive this reference range. So is that optimal for everyone? Probably not. Um, Mm -hmm. So usually when you see a naturopathic doctor, we have what's called like a functional range, which is, you know, the range that we try to stay within so that you can feel optimal, like we can prevent disease before it happens, or, you know, just like preventative medicine versus coming at it whenever things go awry. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So people can get these tested through a a blood test? Yes. So um, estrogen and progesterone, you can get those tested through a blood test. Your doctor may be a little bit reluctant, but they might they might do it. Um, the way I usually order them, I usually order them between days 19 and 21 of the cycle, mm. just because um, we get a most accurate picture of progesterone uh-huh. at that time of the month. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And so think- um, you can get them tested by blood. Right. Awesome. And you said the most common thing you see is high higher estrogen than progesterone. And was there something mm-hmm. else you said you see that's really common in women? Yes. So the other hormonal imbalance slash abnormality would be uh, what's called PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, With that, there is usually a higher level of androgens, which are the male hormones, one of them being testosterone. Mm -hmm. So though, what would flag us to test that would be, for example, if um, a woman is having like missed periods, like skipping periods or um, they're very irregular, um, and, or if there they are signs of like higher androgen levels or testosterone levels, like persistent acne or like, um, 
uh, alopecia, which is like hair loss, especially if it's male pattern hair loss. Mm. So, or, or um, appearance of hair, for example, like on the chin, on, like on the lip, uh, or, you know, excessive body hair when, where it shouldn't be. So those would be, you know, signs to look for that. And what we would find in labs is usually elevated testosterone. So that would be another female mm. health um, hormone imbalance to look at. Yeah. And even with something like PCOS, I imagine, you know, that excessive hair growth or struggle to lose weight that can then cause other mental health concerns, low confidence, depression. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Just... I see that all the time. Yes. And it's like, yeah. what came first, the chicken or the egg? And what do we treat first? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I was... I, I, I always ask my patients this, like, what do you think is contributing to your mental health struggles? Like, for example, if they have PCOS, and I also looked at the research, and some of the most common reasons are because of the, uh, you know, metabolic metabolic issues, issues. it's more difficult to um, lose weight, but also um, there are high levels of inflammation with PCOS, mm. and depression can be also an inflammatory condition. So, wow. Yeah, so it can definitely trigger it that way. What's the difference between endometriosis and PCOS, polycystic PCOS. ovaries? Yeah. So with polycystic ovaries, it's like a syndrome. So it encompasses a few different things. One, there's usually a biochemical and or clinical elevation or signs of high androgens or male hormones that can look like an elevated testosterone blood test mm -hmm. uh, that can look like hirsutism, which is basically hair growth in sort of like the male places or like hair loss in the male uh, pattern. Um, and there is also skipping periods, which often almost always ha happens. Like maybe women with PCOS can sometimes skip periods for like two or three months at a time. Mm. Um, and finally, um, this is not always the case, but if you do an ultrasound of the ovaries, you can see multiple cysts, mm. but not everyone has that. Whereas with endometriosis, it's like, you don't have to have irregular periods. You can have your periods regularly, but they're just extremely painful. Um, there's a lot of inflammation. It's usually very debilitating and, um, the endometrial tissue it can migrate to other different places like your bowels and stuff like that so you could have like diarrhea constipation urinary issues so it's like a very, mm. yeah so, gosh sounds very sounds severe periods very yeah. severe and I honestly think mm -hmm. this this first part there's going to be many parts of this podcast but yeah. it sounds like hormones women's health um testosterone estrogen Let's just go into if someone is struggling with um, really bad periods, hormonal stuff, are there any sort of natural supplements you can recommend women take or women in general? Is there anything we should be taking on a regular basis for our health and hormones? Um, yeah, I mean, it definitely depends on the particular cluster of symptoms or the particular abnormality. Uh, in terms of what's going on but for example with women who have pcos or elevated levels of testosterone um there or and or it comes with insulin resistance which is basically your body's not responding to insulin which is your blood sugar hormone so it's like a cluster um what we normally do is we focus on blood sugar balance so we you know make sure we focus on high healthy, high protein meals and healthy, high fat meals to make sure that insulin levels are optimal and uh, blood sugar level levels are optimal because there is this cascade that happens in the body that when your insulin levels are healthy, your testosterone levels drop if they're mm. high. So by working on insulin resistance, we also work on the high testosterone. Um, yeah, so that's a great strategy of improving that with PCOS, for example. Yes. And you hear this word insulin resistance everywhere. And 
People mm-hmm. are struggling to lose weight because of insulin resistance and people are mm-hmm. going on Saxenda and Ozempic. I don't know if you have that over there. They're weight loss medications yeah. where people um, inject themselves. Can you just go mm-hmm. into more detail of insulin resistance and struggling to lose weight? Because I feel this is massive on social media as well at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Insulin resistance is huge. It- can huge. occur a huge yeah it can occur as part of pcos but it can occur on its own it's almost like the precursor stage of metabolic syndrome and diabetes so it's like one of the first stages and what it basically means is that so <clears throat> insulin is a hormone that our body secretes when we consume carbohydrates um for many different reasons whether we have a very high carbohydrate diet or especially simple carbohydrates um or if uh you know we have a lot of adipose tissue particularly in the abdomen or like central area that can make us insulin resistance um and what happens is our body just doesn't respond to the normal insulin signal so normally what would happen is body releases insulin and blood sugar goes down but in this case, it doesn't, so it remains high. And when blood sugar is high, there's higher levels of inflammation, um, and higher levels of inflammation can make it harder for you know weight management and things like that. Um, so definitely a big issue nowadays, insulin resistance. Wow. Because it's, again, coming back to that, what is it? What do I have? Do I have insulin resistance? Do I have mm-hmm. PCOS? What are some signs that someone may have insulin resistance and how can they find out if that's their thing? Because I don't know how many doctors will say you've got insulin resistance. I'm not sure if that's a a thing, but yeah, Yeah. anything you can say on that? As for that, yeah. Um, So clear signs or symptoms, there aren't many um, just because it's like such a silent process. It's like at the start of everything so it's at the very you know like beginning of things so there aren't necessarily many symptoms so how people catch it is if you go to a naturopathic doctor we like running extensive labs just to make sure that everything's okay um but if you go on your annual physical meet and then you have your labs drawn normally the way we would diagnose insulin resistance is you can get uh fasting blood glucose, um, which can tell you if you have insulin resistance. You can also get what's called HbA1c, which is a marker of your blood sugar over the past three months. Mm -hmm. So that can tell you if there's some insulin resistance. Um, Or you can also get insulin in your blood. So that can also tell you if there is insulin resistance. So there's all these blood markers that can help you diagnose that. Wow. So I think the summary and conclusion is if you are struggling with something, it is so wise to go see a naturopath or a clinical naturopathic doctor to get some extensive bloods run. And I believe this is so useful if you're someone who's tried everything, if you're someone who exercises, who eats all the foods, who gets eight hours of sleep, but something still seems off. It sounds like blood work or speaking to a a naturopathic doctor can be a really good mm-hmm. starting point. Definitely. Um, chronic diseases is what we specialize in. So I love that. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And just one final question for this first part mm-hmm. of our podcast series is how do you know the difference when someone needs naturopathic support versus psychological support? Because there is so much overlap, but how do you sort of determine, okay, this person may be outside of my scope of what I can provide and then Yeah, what happens in that case? Um, Great question. I actually refer all of my patients for psychological support just because I feel like it's part of the holistic management of mental health. Um, I am not licensed to provide therapy, so I can't do psychotherapy, and psychotherapy is a key part of, you know, mental health of healing. Mm. So whatever the diagnosis is, whether it's depression, anxiety, ADHD, um, all of it, really, I always refer to a psychologist. And in this case, in the US, we have, uh, it's usually like a therapist who does that. Um, And they do the psychotherapy part. And I sort of take over like the medical and naturopathic part of things. So we work as a team. I love that. I love that it's part 
of it and you recommend it because yeah. it's it's all holistic and it's all um, needed. So, Dr. Yeah. Stoichev, where can people find you and do you offer this support online to people in Australia? I'm not sure if if you're global or even if mm. someone wants to talk to you about what they can run. Is there any sort of support you can offer and where can people find that support? Yeah, so um, you can find me on, on TikTok and on Instagram uh, at dr.stoichev. That's my tag. Uh, and my website is also available at com. I do work remotely, so my practice is exclusively telehealth currently. So um, I am open to seeing people outside of the U.S. We might just be limited with, you know, the supplements that we can recommend and all that stuff. So we have to usually find some ways around that. Yes. But I'm happy to. I love that. I'm telehealth too. I think it's so necessary and so needed. And I love TikTok and social media. Look at us using yeah. that as okay. a place to reach more people. And if you haven't checked out um, Dr. Stoichev's social media, please do. I absolutely love it. He's got some really great videos and I'll link everything below. But a massive thank you for being on today's episode. I can't wait to speak to you in the next one about ADHD. Let's do it. Thanks, Steph. Thank you.